Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I want to begin today by talking about actually just Pentecost. Uh, we talked about it a little bit during Bible class, and I was very pleased that somebody actually came up with what Penta means. But Pentecost comes from the Greek. And, um, you know, I guess this is a good way to explain that it's not a translation. We talk about transliterations where we sound out a word. So Pentecost is just the sounding out of the Greek word, and then we spell it in English, right? And it just means 50. It refers to the 50 days that today is following Easter for us. But we see here now in first century Judaism, as we read from the book of Acts, they had a, a feast day called Pentecost. They weren't Christians, so they weren't counting the days after Easter. <laughs> but it was the 50th day following Passover. Pentecost, or in Hebrew, Shabbat which was the name of the, the feast day, which our Old Testament will many times say the feast of weeks. It is a seven-week period following Passover, seven weeks of seven days, which is 49, and then on the 50th day comes this celebration, this festival day. It was one of the three major feasts that God commanded his people to observe. The Passover being one, obviously. And then this Feast of Weeks and the Feast of Booths. The Feast of Weeks coincided with the harvest of the wheat. And so it was considered a, 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 a harvest festival. And as such, while there were sacrifices that were offered for sin and for peace and for fellowship, there was this offering of the first fruits. They were to offer a couple of loaves of bread baked with this first harvest of the wheat, a giving back of the first fruits unto God in recognition that God is the one who has provided all things to them, just as he does to us. All things come from God, and the first of everything is returned to God in thanksgiving. Now, when God institutes this Feast of Weeks, he does so based upon um, this harvest time. But it quickly becomes evident that it is also associated with the giving of God's law. So if we consider the first Pentecost, this first harvest, uh, or this first Feast of Weeks, it, it comes three months after the Passover right when Israel comes to the Mount of Sinai. And Moses goes up on the mountain, and he receives from God the Ten Commandments. And there's a couple of places in the scriptures where we see that this giving of God's law to the Israelites is part of this Feast of Weeks. And so in first century, um, uh, Jerusalem, as they celebrate this Feast of Weeks, it has a strong connection to the giving of God's law. So now think about this context. This is Pentecost for the Jews. Those that had gathered, as we read from the book of Acts, from all over the known world, are the Jews in diaspora, they, how they had been spread throughout the world through various different things, sometimes Taking, being taken captive, sometimes migrating. But they are Jews and proselytes, those that are being converted or have converted to Judaism. And they speak all these different languages. And because they come from, so many, some, in some cases, a very distant land, it, it takes them a long time to get to Jerusalem. And so this this observation as God commanded of observing Passover and the Feast of Weeks, it might be a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for some of them. So they come to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover, and they stay. They stay for this whole 50 days so that they can celebrate also then the Feast of Weeks. 
celebrate Pentecost. Now, it's much longer until they get to the third festival, so they probably go home after that. But these are the same people that have been gathered and were present during the crucifixion of Jesus as well. So when they start hearing the mighty works of God in their languages, they might have been eyewitnesses as well of the crucifixion and the resurrection, and maybe even the ascension of Jesus. They're gathered here with this great anticipation, this, this uh, looking forward to the celebration of God handing over himself in his work, of presenting himself to his people in the words of man, in his law, his expression of himself to us. And the, the whole idea of the first fruits is kind of turned around for us. Whereas in the harvest, the first fruits of the harvest are given to God, but here God gives the first fruits of himself in his spirit to mankind. A deposit, if you will, of of, of the fullness of what will be the knowledge of God, the proclamation of the gospel, let's see, the drawing of man to God. And just as it was on Mount Sinai when the people were gathered around the mountain and terrified because God presents himself in this dark cloud and, and Moses is up on the mountain and what's happening? The lightning and the thunder is flashing and there's fire. The fire up on top of the mountain, representative of God in his presence speaking, giving Moses his word. And so we see too. On the day of Pentecost, the sound of a rushing wind that gathers everybody together. This is what this is what draws the crowd to the apostles. And the lighting of the spirit in the forms of these these tongues of fire upon the heads of the apostles. And then the proclamation of God's word. The gospel being proclaimed in languages that all may understand. So I think I will tie it back to the Old Testament. Because there's an aspect in the Old Testament where the people were unifying themselves together, building a city, building a tower up to heaven. They were, they were drawing themselves together in a human unity of oneness, of ego and hubris, as they were making a name for themselves as they disobeyed God's word. That is, where he told them to be fruitful and to fill the earth. They refused to disperse. And so God confuses their languages and forces them to disperse. He breaks up their unity. But here, in, on this day of Pentecost, as we read from the book of Acts, he draws them together. He draws them together and unifies them, even as we prayed in the collet that we would be one. He unifies them in his word. He unifies them in the gospel message of his son. He draws them together from all nations and all tongues into a true unity. A unity of faith that, that in this world binds us in the Son of God. God is the one who provides unity among us and among uh, his church to himself. So as Christ was the first fruits, that is, the first being representative of the whole, he suffered, and he died for the sins, thus dying for all of us. He also rose from the dead, rising for all, and then ascended into heaven, ascending for all. He is the first fruits 
from the Passover, from Easter. He is the, the, and here we see that the Spirit is now the first fruits given to us of Pentecost. The first portion of, of that which we apprehend through faith that assures us of the whole. That we are part of the whole, the church. The fullness then of God's peace becomes ours. As we are drawn into the presence of God and to his land of promise. In our translation from which we read today, the English Standard Version, Jesus calls the Holy Spirit the helper. Many of you are probably going to know the Greek word that, that is there, paraclete. You have at least heard it before. And, it, and it's translated in a number of different ways. Some English translations, though, don't translate it. They transliterate it, like I was talking about with Pentecost. And they just put paraclete in there. A word which we find a challenge, I would say, in English, because there's not a, it, it doesn't really mean anything in English. But by transliterating it and actually putting paraclete in there, it expands beyond just helper for us. Because other translations, they would use advocate, counselor, comforter, and, and, and drawing from different aspects of what that word would mean. But here we, they all kind of help us understand that as Martin Luther puts forward in his explanation to the third article, the work of the Spirit is to do these things, um, to help us, to comfort us, to counsel us, to be an advocate for us. As he shows us our Savior, and he brings to us the consolation that is ours in the forgiveness of sins. As he eases our conscience, knowing that the things which burden us have been borne by our Savior, he lays upon us then the fullness of God's peace, something that we learn to understand in time, even as we look to its fullness in eternity. And so the Holy Spirit accompanies God's word where, wherever and whenever it is proclaimed. He does so so that he might bear witness to the saving grace of God that is given to us in his Son, Jesus Christ, whereby we then have the forgiveness of our sins. He helps us and he aids us in every aspect of the faith so that we might understand, that we might believe, that we might receive and thus have a life. He helps us understand all the facts of the Bible. You know, like we were talking about bitumen this morning from uh, the Old Testament reading. Yeah, so he helps us understand that as we were looking it up, that, that in that land of Shinar or Shinar, where these people were living, it's at the cusp of the Stone Age before they entered into the Bronze Age. Just plain facts, it all makes sense. But even more though, the Holy Spirit helps us understand the truth of the Bible. He helps us understand Jesus and who he is. He helps us understand the utter depravity of man. That it doesn't matter which age we go to, that every one of us is like those people building a city and a tower to show how wonderful we are. He shows us that our greatness is nothing before God, but rather that we are fully dependent upon God, not just in this life, but for salvation from the very things that we think are so great. He helps us understand our need for a Savior. But even beyond understanding this, he helps us so that we might believe this incomprehensible love that God has shown towards us, apart from any goodness in us, and that somehow in his great goodness, 
he can love even us and send for us a redeemer to save us from our cursed existence by placing the curse upon his own son. And the Spirit helps us receive this very gift of forgiveness of our sins as he works through the ministry of the church, as he, as he promises to ever be present where the word is proclaimed and where the sacraments are administered. Where those means of grace exist, there the Spirit is present and active. And he bestows the very thing that is promised there. He gives of God's great goodness the very thing that God says that he gives. The very thing that he offers. He helps us receive peace. Even in these troubled times. Where we don't need to be, I don't know, discouraged or overcome by them. He gives us life. Real life. Even as we daily face death. And he helps us to then live these lives of faith here, according to God's word in a, in a world that is confused by so many voices. He helps us so that we might hear the voice of our good shepherd, that we might know and follow the voice of our Lord Jesus Christ. Even amidst the din of so many false prophets, so that we have that comfort of knowing that we live in unity with him now, even as we shall live with him in unity for eternity. Thus, the Holy Spirit abides with his church, with you, pointing you always to your Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.